Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martin Donaghy. Um, I'm a master's student working with Dr. Nick Rattenbury at the University of Auckland, Department of Physics, um, working in the area of gravitational microlensing. The particular project I'm working on at the moment um, is a data mining project using open source software, and I'm working with the MOA catalogue. So you probably heard a bit about MOA today. Um, so just to remind everyone, uh, MOA is the microlensing observations in astrophysics which is a joint New Zealand-Japan uh, collaboration, originally set up to investigate the nature of dark matter. So just a brief bit about gravitational lensing. So uh, as Nick was talking about earlier, space-time is curved in the presence of a gravitational field. The effect of that, as the light rays passing close to the massive object are bent, which and means that background dark objects are distorted, producing multiple images. So just got a couple of little diagrams here. So you can see here, we've got the background object here, the lens here, which in this case is a galaxy cluster. And observing from the Earth here, you can see the effect of the mass of, this, uh, of the, uh, the galaxy cluster there on the background object. The light, these right lasers are, are deflected. And you see these as two separate images here on either side. And here's just an image from the Hubble Space Telescope just showing us the same uh, real example of this effect. So here we have the uh, foreground red galaxy here, which is the lensing object, and we have this blue galaxy in the background. And the, the, alignment, in, oops, the alignment in this case is such that the, the, it's almost a complete Einstein ring there. So the images are, the, the alignment's almost spot on, so that the, the image is almost uh, a complete full circle around. As for microlensing, uh, the, in the case of microlensing, the object is typically a star. And as we're saying, as saying earlier, the, the distortion is related, to the, the separation of the images, sorry, is related to the mass of the lensing object. So in the case of a star, the image separation is quite small, on the order of milli arc seconds. And which means that we can't actually resolve the two images separately. However, if the lens, so in this case the star, is moving across the line of sight, so here's a line of sight from this from the Earth to the source. If we have a star moving across this line of sight here, then that amplifies the signal. So here is just a little to show the geometry. So we've got these deflected lens, uh, rays from the, the source object coming to the observer, deflected by the lens, and we see these two separate images, which, as we're saying, in the case of microlensing, the mass of the lens is not strong enough to resolve the two of them. However, if we monitor this over time, so here we have our telescope on the ground, this diagram, the, the lens and object, is a black hole, but it's irrelevant because the, the only thing that matters is the mass of the object. And again, that comes back to what Nick was saying about the, the, one of the, the nice things about microlensing is that the, the lens and object doesn't need to be emitting any light. You can still infer information about it. So if we're monitoring this, this star from our position on the Earth, before the lens passes across the front, we see it as its normal background star. The lens comes across the front, amplifies the signal, so see, we see it as a brightness. So just to show you a light curve, I think Nick had this one earlier as well. So this is some real data. Um, we have the different, the different telescopes here showing the data points. Um, so you can see the data sort of sparse and uh, regularly sampled. Um, so yeah, so this, this is the typical it's what you would see for a single lens and object. However, this type of variation, uh, this type of brightening um, with time is not something that's unique to microlensing. You see it with a lot of uh, other different types of uh, astrophysical phenomena. So you have different, a lot of different types of variable stars, Cepheid variables, RR Lyrae's, etc. Eclipse and binaries that Alex was talking about earlier as well. All these different things have been catalogued by MOA. Um, as well, the searching for the microlensing, because as Nick was saying, the different the the, uh, the MOA telescope uses difference imaging analysis. So it's basically it just has a reference image, and it looks for any change, whether that's a brightening, any change in brightness. So the result of all that is that MOA has also catalogued thousands of other astrophysical events as well. So at the moment, this data is all just sitting sitting uh, from the mid 90s is all sitting just in one of the servers uh, over at Massey because we just, there's just too much data for anyone to manually go through and look at any large subset of this data. So the aim of my project is to look at ways to classify these data into distinct types of astrophysical event. 
So just for a sense of scale, so we're talking in the case of MOA, MOA observes 50 million stars uh, and the, towards the galactic bulge in the LMC. Gaia here, which is, so that's a space-based telescope, which was started operating just at the end of last year. That's going to be, that's observing the position of about a billion stars across the galaxy. It's going to measure their position uh, with the highest precision yet. And LSST, so that's the largest in optic survey telescope, that's going to be coming online within the next decade and that's going to be uh, collecting about 20 terabytes of data every night. And also as Nicholas was just talking about with square kilometre array, again you're talking about terabytes a second. So it's uh, an enormous amount of data and now uh, and it really is the era of big astronomy. So if we can't manually process all that, how do we do it? Well the solution is to use machine learning algorithms. So the idea being that we use uh, automated classifiers to separate these, uh, the instances of each of these objects in uh, multi-dimensional attribute space. In order to do that, we've decided to use Weka, which is the YCATO environment for knowledge analysis. And that's an open source uh, Java-based uh, toolbox of machine learning algorithms, which was developed by the University of YCATO down in Hamilton. So some of the typical problem types that these, uh, the Weka, Weka can handle. So classification, obviously that's what we're concerned with here. But it can also use, be used for regression or clustering problems. Uh, one of the things that yeah, attracted us about Weka was the compatibility. So Octave, uh, look at the R Weka, which is a yeah, Weka implementation of R. There's also a Python wrapper, which allows you to uh, incorporate Weka, the use of Weka as well. So as well as the compatibility aspect of it, it was the fact that, as I say, I'm doing a master's this year, so time was restricted, so we really wanted uh, something that was ready to go straight away, that was, we knew would be reliable, and Weka is well supported. Uh, the guys down there have been really helpful, and they'd offered to provide us with support. Obviously, they're geographically close as well, which is another big advantage. Um, so that was our decision to go uh, with the Weka guys. There are other alternatives. The most notable one is probably Astro ML, which is a, a Python module um, built on NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib, uh, which is another good alternative. But as I say, it was really the aspect of the fact that uh, Weka was well supported by the guys down there, and we knew they could, we could rely on them if we needed help getting this classifier running. So as for the, the classifier itself, we've chosen to go with the random forest classifier. So that's supervised, so basically that just means that you're using a training set and you're not just running it blind. Um, and the, the main features that I tried to build it was the, the, the accuracy of it. Um, it's fast computationally and it's really robust to outliers and irrelevant features. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So how does it work um, itself? So basically it's a tree-based classifier and each node of the tree the classifier takes uh, a random subset of the, the features, so you might have 10, 20, 30 different features or attributes that characterise your data. The classifier takes a random subset of them and chooses the best uh, attribute to split that node of the tree from that, from that random subset. You go down the next node of the tree and it continues again until you get to a node size of 1. So once you've got one, one tree, you repeat the process again until you have multiple trees, so you, and so you may be hundreds or thousands of trees, uh, effectively a forest, hence the name. And what, how you estimate these, the probabilities is basically you, once you have your forest built, you, you take the data that you want to classify and you just run it down all these thousands of trees and they effectively the, 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 these, the trees vote for the most likely class. So this is just a little illustration. So here we have, so this would be one tree, that's another tree, all the way up here. So you can see in this case, so you would, so each, each point, each node in this tree, there's a different attribute that's been chosen to split the, to split the data. You take your, your data point here, or your instance of the class, you run it down here. So you can see in this case, this tree votes for, for this class, this tree votes for another class, this tree votes for another class, and then you average the results over all the trees and that is what gives you the, the most likely classification for, your, for that instance of the data. So again, this is just another, just to illustrate. So you have different trees and they've all, and each one of these trees will be slightly different. And again, so you can see the probabilities from this one 
and averages. So that's basically just says the probability of a given a, a class given your your uh, input data. Averages results out, and that will give you the the most uh, likely classification for that particular instance. So how do we apply this in this? So first of all, we we need to build the training set. So in the case of more, we're actually using synthetic light curves. So in an ideal world, we would have had this data would all have been previously labelled through third-party methods, people going through it manually. So we'd have a stack of all the different types of events. And then we could have taken them and used that to train our classifier. However, as Nick was saying, uh, just manpower issues really. That's not that's not been done with the Mo database, but it has been done with Ogle, which is the the another Michael Engine collaboration, which, uh, which is joint between the uh, Polish astronomers and the US. So they've got all their data. It's all it's all free and open data. It's online. The whole catalogue's up there. So basically, we've just taken we're using their light curves, reconstructing their uh, light curves that they've previously classified into all these different types of events. Then from that, we're then adding noise from our database, so again the synthetic data, so we want to make it, we want to try and make it, uh, we need to add our, our own noise because every, every telescope and all that sort of thing, all, in, all of the instrumentation, the, the noise is going to be different depending on, the, on your setup. So we're going to add noise to these synthetic light, to these template light curves and then well, after that we've trained the classifier. So to train the classifier, basically that just means you're extracting all the different features from the, you're trying to characterise your light curve. So you'd be looking so you for the, the period analysis. I'm using what Alex was talking about earlier, the conditional entropy. That's what we're using for that. So we want to take each of those light curves, pre-process them so we can extract all these features from them. So we want like so the period, we want to like fit harmonics uh, to them as well, things like skewness and kurtosis, all these different there's a huge array of different features that you can use um, to best classify the light curve and that's part of basically what the a big part of the project is going to be um, once we're training this classifier is going to be what's the best selection of features um, to characterise the data how we're going to balance that with computation time etc because um, the, the main thing with the random forest method is building the actual classifier once, the, once you've got your forest built it's relatively comparably trivial, trivial just to, to take your data and then run it down all the seeds of trees. So that's the, the big thing is training, is training the classifier. So again, so we're, that's all, all the pre-processing stuff. We're using Python for that. Um, NumPy, SciPy, that's all done in that. Um, yep, and as I say, using the conditional entropy method that Alex was talking about earlier. Yeah, and then once we've got that, once we've got our classifier all trained, then it's a case of running our data through and seeing what pops out. And then that's going to lead to so likes of Alex is looking at eclipse and binaries. So the future if this is if you were looking if you we would we would hope to put all this online and similar to what Ogle's done, so that all this would be free and open open access to all this 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 whole catalogue. So if you're in your particular area, you're interested in eclipse and binaries, you just look up the catalogue and you've got it right there. Instead of at the moment Alex is interested in eclipse and binaries, he's Unfortunately, got to just suffer and uh, struggle through the data himself. So, just with a view to, oh, sorry, just a couple of other considerations. So, to also to, to improve the some of the there's a couple of groups in the ES that have been looking at this sort of stuff with a view to future LSST and Gaia and the like. And one of the the couple of ways to improve the performance of the classifier, one of which is active learning. So, instead of um, Instead, instead of um, yeah, sorry. Instead, instead of getting to the point where uh, the the classifier is not there's uh, there's uh, some some of the, the instances of the, the classifier that's not going to be very accurate. Instead of putting instead of uh, instead of putting them into different categories, you can basically you can hold them back for a, a human or somebody to manually go through and look at the sort of and identify these by eye, um, and then. Classify them, which can and basically this combination of uh, they've, some of the groups have found that this sort of combination of using the automated aspects, but then with the end with this, some of the stuff that's you know noisy and uncertain things like that by having a, using a, a human to manually analyse that uh, can improve the performance considerably. And also the, there's other options sort of noisification or denoisification. So in that instance, you basically try to 
take the noise out of your data and match it to the ideal light curve, which is kind of what we initially started with with the Yolo stuff. So that's a couple of other considerations that can, you know, as I say, that can uh, possibly improve things, but that's, that's for, for future. And just to briefly say sort of the long-term goal of this, this type of work, I mean, what I'm doing at the moment is kind of laying the foundation, but in the future, the, the ultimate aim would be to get a real-time glass fire running um, on, down on the, the Moe telescope. So like Sir John was talking about uh, supernovae earlier, so you, basically you want to, you want to have a, your glass fire running in real time so that as these events are happening, so the typical microlensing and events uh, time scale will be a couple of weeks, uh, so you basically you want to have your class fire running so that as you get more data points you're continually uh, narrowing down what this event is because if it's something interesting, something rare like a supernovae then you want to get other telescopes on it and alert the community. So again that's just uh, for future, but I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Martin. Um, that was great. Do we have any questions for Martin? Oh, we have lots of questions. Excellent, excellent. I saw you first. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, congratulations for a nice presentation. How much uh, power would your algorithm consume for machine learning? Um, well, it's really just the training the classifier aspect, so that's a, a good question. We're going to be working, we've got the, the NESI cluster and the, the university to use for that. So again, that's really something that's to be determined by, as I say, all the, what features we use, how many we use. How much, you know, how much do we, what sort of, how many bins do we want to use? Do we want to just categorise it into four or five different types of event, or are we wanting to, you know, subdivide them further into, you know, ten or twenty? That's really, that will really be determined by by that. You're happy with Nessie? Yeah, yeah, we've got that. That's happy to use that that option. Yeah. Good day. Oh, um, hi. One of the things that I've seen as a problem in um, rule by or sort of machine learning systems is it does they don't really give you the the machine learning rules don't aren't really equatable to real world axioms that we might you know, mm -hmm. use to explain the data ourselves is there a way of do you see a, a way of getting using the machine learning system to actually tell us some general rules about uh, the you know, the you data that you're working with. Do you mean about different types of event? I mean, do you mean to be general? You, Ge mean you know, general observations that can help us predict not just how that particular system works, but that may actually give us insights into other systems, other other properties of stars that we're not current. That this particular. Yeah, I mean that would be kind at. of the point of the kind of the you know the sort of. Like as I say, what Nick was saying earlier, I've, we've we, you know, this is we've seen this type. This is variable stars. This is eclipses and binaries. This is micro lens, and that might be a planet. What's this? You know, this is different. We've never seen this before. And I guess that would be the, you know, that would be the way the kind of new science would come in. Of this is a, an event that's not been seen before. How can we use what we know at the moment to try and um, make, uh, yeah? How can we how can we use that our current theories to actually best understand what this has shown us? So I guess that would be the, uh, yeah, for that. Do we have some more questions? If you have questions, leave your hands up and we'll get, we'll get to you. We do have a little bit of time, so we're happy to take some more. Okay. I think we're done. Thanks, Martin, very much. Well.